Hi, I'm Keith Reynolds. Welcome to Pot, uh, this Marketplace, our podcast about sales, marketing, and rock and roll. And uh, we are going live here with Mark Carter. Mark, welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. So um, it's really great to have you on. Um, you and I met through H7. We had yes. Clay Hicks on last week. Um, just tell us a little bit of your experience with H7 and to segue from last week. H7 has been great. I've been a member for what November was my one year anniversary. So a year, three months, year and four months, somewhere in there. Love it. Meet great people. I love the B2B aspect and focus of it. That's my focus. And I love that they have multiple groups, not just a general big B2B one, but they break them down in the West coast, Chicago, New York. And he just does a great job of getting good people as members that stick around. They go to it. You get a chance to really brand yourself because you see the same people, the key players again and again in different rooms. And they say it takes eight touch points to get a sale or referral. You definitely get that with H7. That's yeah. cool. I've uh, been extremely fortunate you were the first person who contacted me out of my on my first meeting. Oh, I didn't realize it was and your first meeting. When I said what I it was literally my first meeting. And I should say we don't have Tom Dempsey on today because we're having some audio uh, problems and uh so we're just uh it's just you and I. But yeah, it was my first uh H7 meeting and I said what I did and you said I want to talk to you and We've been talking about collaborating and how what we do in terms of building content hubs and building podcast ecosystems, which are the chapters or or uh, episodes of, of a content hub. Uh, and, and it's just a great content strategy to really focus your distribution of your media for lead generation. And, and we connect it to HubSpot. And when I said that, you're like, I want to work with you. And here we are doing our first podcast. And we're really talking uh, about how do we serve the marketplace? Because there's a great need for this. So you're thank very you. welcome. Thank you. So uh, this uh, this interview is really about you. You know, tell us about yourself and your background and how you developed this passion for interviewing. And I also want to get a plug in for your book. Oh, thank you. As far as the passion for interviewing, gosh, I'll date myself here. Senior year of college, 1999, decided I wanted to strike out on my own, do something different, but I knew it was not going to be corporate my whole life. And second nature to me, I didn't, I don't remember reading in a book or being told to do it, but I just thought if I want to be successful someday, why not hang around and interview successful people? So at that time, it's, you know, senior in college, I'm not hiring a web design firm and printing company to design stuff. So I taught myself web design, taught myself uh, the Adobe suite, made my own business card website, left corporate America, went back to waiting tables. Anyone that would give me the time of day, I was I want to learn how you got successful. My I found when I was writing my book, my first notebook, a tattered green mead spiral bound wires bent notebook from February of 1999. It was the head coach University of Michigan's basketball team that year and a Grammy award winning jazz musician were my first two prepared interviews. And I've been doing it ever since. And that's what led to a YouTube station. I just published episode 90 of my podcast today. And that's what led to the book. It's not my experiences. It's like 10% me. It's what I learned from these people. And I'm just ridiculously mm. grateful that so many people have given me the time of day and still do to learn from them. Tell us some of the people you've interviewed. 90, that's incredible. Yeah, that's the podcast. YouTube's a whole nother number. Um, so the people, the first two that I just mentioned were great because they were gracious enough. I didn't know what the heck I was doing with interviewing. My first, go to YouTube, my first YouTube video, I didn't, it was 2012, did not want to be on video, did not like for a, a multitude of reasons. Mm. And I was involved with Meeting Professionals International at the time and they were having a conference and they said, well, we I was dealing with speakers and book tours and book launches for New York Times bestselling authors. I said, you live in this world. We want the founder of Ted. Like, no problem. I, I got this. Nobody knew him. He was a ghost. So I called his office. I did the CEO call, 730 in the morning, Rhode Island time before the team would be there, left the message. 
Less than an hour later, he called me back himself. Long story short, I figured I booked him for the conference. We got along famously. And I told my videographer, just bring the camera, set it up in a room. I don't know if he's going to say yes, because I don't see many recent interviews, but it's not going to hurt to do it. And I did my research. He was always a talking head. I'm like, I'm safe. He doesn't want other people on camera with him. Literally five minutes before it started, I'm thinking that my guy can take care of it in post-production. He says, grabs my arm and says, you're in this with me. I'm like, I guess I'm in this with you. My first video interview, being in the meetings and events industry in 2012, he is who he is. It was a nine and a half minute interview, completely improvised. And my favorite thing to hear now is that's a good question. When my guests think about it for a minute, I forget what I asked him. The first answer to my first question on camera was that's not a good question. Let's start over. So that's where my video career started. And since then, it's been people that you wouldn't recognize with successful serial entrepreneurs to, if you like sports, Bo Jackson with mentoring uh, in the business world or for new relationships, the creator of customer relationship management and all these people. I love it because I'm learning from them. It's not just talking to them for a name drop, but they actually teach me different things about mentoring and business and relationships and events. And that's the best part. And what I love most about the interviews I do, I'm not big on asking about childhood memories. I'm big on asking, how can I do something different after I get done talking to you? So um, that's an incredible lineup. I want to get to some of the things you've learned and, and like what's been along your your journey, but tell us, I also know you, you interviewed Michael Dell. Yes. And to me, that's like the Holy grail of interviews. When, when you can get to that level, do you have a story about that interview with Michael Dell? The, the interview with Michael Dell was at, that was one of my, no, my first respectably, I'll call my respectably paid interviewing gig. And he was really good. We, they do a ton of prep. It was for Dell world, their annual big, huge conference in, um, drawn a blank, Austin, Texas. And he was one of the last ones we interviewed. And I do remember him being so gracious and helpful. I didn't know what it was going to be. We went off script a little bit. He didn't mind. They prep you. I mean, hardcore prep for the interview. And it was a live stream that went out. So there was a definite agenda to that one, which is different than most of my interviews and all of my interviews today, which are improvised with a little bit of background, but it was interesting. And it was, uh, good moment you know to be on camera and realize okay they trusted me enough to put him in a chair next to me that's really cool um and and that level of professionalism i've seen some of your other interviews i know you prepare for them um tell us a little bit about your process and how you um prepare for these and you, you mentioned that they're improvisational i also noticed that you did improv uh, on your website, uh, you have an experience with that. So just tell us a little bit about your process and how you work with people um, in, in the interview. The process has changed dramatically, I'd say in the last two years, as far as the improv background goes, I volunteered at the Chicago Improv Festival in 2007, 10th anniversary. My friend was very gracious to me, put me in charge of the green room and VIP after party. So I got to hang out with everyone from like SNL and the rest of the people that were there from TV and movies. And I realized, you know, I knew nothing about improv at the time. And I just told him, you know, I showed him my badge. So I'm not going to bug you or pest you. I'm not asking for autographs. I just want to know what don't people know about improv? How has it changed your life? And oh my God, they talked my ear off for a week. And I realized it's a science here. This is in the first thing they teach you in improv lesson one. It's not about being funny. That's stand up comedy. Improv is about being in the moment. And after being in that world for a little bit as a voyeur, I finally jumped and said, I, I'm going to learn this because it's I was not doing good at keynote speaking, but I was a facilitator and an interviewer. And I thought improv is going to help me. That's a skill set I need. Forget about keynote speaking training. I'm over it. And I took a full year of improv and by full year intensive, three to four hours a week for an entire year, plus getting on stage in front of the class, we wired my brain to think on my feet, be in the moment, have an awesome conversation. And that's what's led me to, I used to, when I started my podcast, I would do a prep and I would have talking points listed. I only did um, audio because I would be doing this and writing notes and I didn't want that to be on camera. It's not professional. 
And about 80 episodes in, I finally realized, okay, I got this. I've done enough. So what I do is I have a jumping off point now where we know the topic of the conversation. And I realize how hardwired my brain got for improv. It's just like when the audience yells, here's a city, Boston, or coconut, whatever they say. I tell them we're going to come up with a jumping off point. I do meet with them before when I can to build rapport, get to know them a little bit. So it's not the first time on cameras, the first time we're meeting. As far as the interview itself, the simplest form I use with me, I use yes and. And every question I ask is based on the last answer they gave. And what I found is that creates this awesome energy and momentum as opposed to scripted questions. You ask, stop, ask, stop. I just keep going and carry the conversation for either eight minutes, eight unedited minutes on YouTube, 20 minutes on the podcast, 45 minutes in the radio interview. And a big part of my process that helped me early on that I all, I love to share with interviewers and potential interviewers one of the biggest things I learned is two questions, how and why. Basically, anything that the person you're interviewing just said, oh, really, how did you start your business? Why did you start your business? If you feel like you're stalled out, like, oh, I don't know what to ask, or you have prepared questions and they get through them really quick, which happened to me when I was early on in my career with interviewing, how and why to almost always will pull you out. And the big thing is it elicits a story. How I started a business, I got my funding, and they stopped. Oh, really? How did you get funding? Why did you start your business? Those two questions can help you get out of almost any stuck point in any interview. So how do you then work with people who are coming on and they're first timers, right? They're ner really nervous. Like, what do you tell people uh, when you realize that that's where they are and you've got to do this interview? You've got all this knowledge that you've applied yourself. How do you package it up for somebody who's start, starting out. I'd love to say I have a silver bullet. The how and why is the biggest thing I teach them. The, the, the second thing is turn the camera on and hit record. Just like my first interview, turn the camera. I didn't release it for a while because I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I want hit record. And that's what I learned is that I wish I would have started doing video interviews five plus years earlier. Really, because the only thing you can do, you can get good at it. Some people they say are naturals. I, I don't know of anyone I can think of that comes to mind but the, it, you have to just do it and you have to be able to deal with like I did in my mm -hmm. first interview with the God of uh, events. That's not a good, just roll with it. But anyone that wants to do an interview, even if you keep them private public, you have a little bit more exposure. And I had that one put under the gun with a popular blog where the dissected what I did right and wrong for my first ever interview. And I let them do it. It just comes from experience. And the, the only way you can really learn to do interviewing yeah. is just keep doing them again and again and again and again. And watch yourself, get feedback from the guests, and start to dissect your own videos about what you do. When you see you do something good, like asking how and there why, do it again. And then pick something else up. Be and your do own it again. best media critic. Be your own best media critic. And get constructive feedback send it to people you trust even if it's private and say what do you think what could i do better what do you think what could i do better i when you said that um this is, i think is our sixth linkedin live and i'll tell you i procrastinated for six months i had the restream account and uh it, you really have to stare into your you know inner self and get the courage yeah you know, to go live to be on video and um the first time I ever appeared on video, I was IBM's first collegiate rep. I was trotted around the country to sell IBM PCs. And one of the things I had to do was go down to 57th Street, Manhattan, and uh, do a show. And I was being interviewed in like a talk show format, and I'd never been on TV. And I was so nervous. They had, you know, it loaded me up with everything to say. And then I, I, I couldn't get my face working right it didn't and this producer comes up to me and he goes tell you what all i want you, you know your stuff all i want you to do is smile while you go everybody's gonna think smiles play really big on yeah. tv just smile everybody's gonna think you're fine and inside you're gonna be shaking and i i've always that's why i've not been afraid ever since then nice that's the way to do it yeah um so we kind of got into some of the things you talked to about with people to be on the on camera with you for the yeah. interview but what about 
some of the things that you've learned from people. Uh, you know, you've got these amazing interviews. What what are your takeaways? How are they building your your business and your personal life? A lot of ways I'm passionate about mentoring. So a lot of the interviews that I've done are about mentoring. So you can, I think you could always get better at being a mentor and be mentored. That was a big one. I, a few years ago, I was on a mentor, uh, a mentoring bender and did a lot of interviews, which really helped I put them out in public, did some programs for college students, graduate and undergraduate level to really get that out there. The biggest thing, one of the biggest things I took away when I was in the events industry was talking to the event pros instead of making only my own mistakes and events, how to produce a conference, what to do to get sponsors, how to get the speakers, I interview people and learn from them. And now anytime I want to do something new, for example, when I got into podcasting a few years ago, and I did the same, I sat on it for probably two years of just, I'll get to it. And I made all the excuses. And I figure if I do what I've always done, I want to learn about podcasting. So, and it's no longer existing. I still own the domain, but for a while I ran podcastingadvice.com. It was a podcast on Apple also, the podcasting advice podcast. And I figured I'm going to interview people up to the point where they get paid really well to do podcasts. Why just put something out on my own and hope for the best when I can learn from them and communities like that were awesome. They were so generous with their time and so helpful. They knew I was, I hadn't even launched until that. I hadn't even launched the first podcast yet. And then I did while I was learning and I started putting them out more and more while I was learning. And it's examples like that, that I tell people with interviews, whether it's public facing or private facing, if you want to do something, go talk to the people who have walked the solution to the problem you're facing and ask them for help, ask them for advice. And that's that's what I would learn with events. It's where I learned with podcasting. It's what I learned with video. And I learned about business relationships from some of the top people out there, networking skills. When I first moved to Chicago, I'd never been to a formal networking event in my life. I was in my early 20s. So I just sought out everyone I could that wrote books on it, that were speaking on networking and relationship building and referrals. And I got so good at it that, that those were my first paid gigs was teach my team how to get referrals, teach my team how to network, not just work a room, but mean build meaningful relationships. I was trying to be a life coach and people have said, forget that. I'd get referred by a high level contact of theirs. Like forget the life coaching stuff you're trying to do. Teach my team how to network and get referrals. We'll pay you for it. And that came out of just me being curious. And that's one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give to anybody be genuinely curious, talk 20% at a time, listen 80% of the time. Fascinating. Um, you, you know, it, it was um, Napoleon Hill, right? You'll get everything out of life by helping others get what they exactly. want out of life. And, and uh, this gift of interviewing, I, I can really see uh, why you attract to mentorship. Uh, because you learn and you also share. You like to oh, share. Oh, now it's all, now I, I can't get enough of I'm up to almost two videos a week on YouTube now with, of interviews. So um, I know interviewing was a big part of writing your book. Talk to us a little bit about your book and what how, how the interviewing played a role in it and what you're trying to accomplish. It was and the book people. was a, a combination of interviews and notes that I took. I had to go through years of, I mean, we're talking old school paper, pen to paper notebooks. And I went through that. And then I also started reading. I taught myself how to speed read biographies and autobiographies. So people that it, they're no longer Napoleon Hill was one. Uh, Michael Dell was another home. Home Depot was another. I would read entire biographies and autobiographies just to get one story for the book. And I wrote it based on the interviews I had with people. And while I was writing the book and I found sections and I found common threads with successful people, I started interviewing them to get the, get their story. So I would have original stories from the book, not just another Southwest West airline story that everyone's already beaten to death. And the, the, I call it the anchor story of the book that explained the book's called idea climbing, how to build a support system for your next big idea. My anchor story became a guy who, built two separate companies to over 1 billion with a B in revenue. His story was awesome. It's as far as I know, it's only in my book. He built a bunch of other companies that, in the tens and hundreds of millions, but it was learning from people like that and learning that he, I was no longer a 20 something year old kid. I'm in my forties now. 
So the wide-eyed doe thing is another thing that I think about it off the top of my head. When you're younger, ask to interview people. It's insane. The, the people you think the CEO, that serial entrepreneur will talk to you, they will. And for research for the book, people are very gracious for their time. So the that's what the book is. It's finding the common threads, one of which, of course, was mentoring. Almost every successful person I spoke with had mentoring experiences, at least being mentored, if not turning around when they became successful and got mentored. And I realized most big ideas die on the shelf because people don't have the support. They think it's the lone wolf. It's blood, sweat, and tears. I have to go it alone. And I point out in the book that everybody from Napoleon Hill to Michael Dell, Home Depot, the guy I mentioned who's my anchor story, Bo Jackson, everyone in between that's in the book, they had a support system that they built either with unconscious competence or conscious competence intentionally. They had a ton of people around them to support their idea, a relationship marketing to share their idea, broadcast their idea to, with the world to other people's yeah. networks. And that's how it happened. I haven't come across a single person that was a lone wolf once you did it, once I did a little digging. You know, I, I'll just share my own experience. Um, with you and your curiosity about the podcast ecosystem and what I do and how we connect it to HubSpot and, you know, what our vision is, because we're, we're a startup and your interest in it and your your willingness to collaborate uh, is, is just playing out with what you just said about uh, the, the thesis behind your book. And and it's what I'm trying to do is build a network. I didn't know I was playing into your your wily way. <laughs> It's working out well so far. I'll take credit. <laughs> so I got one more question before I start asking you about your rock and roll experience and your favorite yeah. bands and all that. Um, uh, you and I both produce media, right? And we do it yep. in service of others. Um, talk a little bit about the quality of media, why it works, why do people buy your service and what kind of results do they get how do they use your interviews when you do a professional interview with an or you know leaders of an organization just just talk let's talk about the value and how media can be leveraged uh right it's i i, I don't need to say we need to, uh, a lot about we live in a media driven society uh. we talk about personal branding but you know give us some in the trenches learnings with media, it's it's about getting comfortable on camera. And at least if you're talking about quality on my behalf as an interviewer, one comment I get, because I've been doing it so long, is you make me feel comfortable. I felt like I was sitting in Starbucks. That's something any interviewer should be going for. You want to get them comfortable. You don't want to push the envelope too hard or come in with these slick questions to see if you can get them stuck. You want to get people comfortable. And I think the quality of media, if you want to talk pure technology, it's come out a lot in the public domain that people are using their phones, at the end of the day, some media is better than no media. Your phones have good quality cameras in them. If you have to use your phone to do an interview or something like that, that's more accepted these days, unless you're a broadcast station. I've even had, read some articles where people said, I trust that novice a little bit more because it's authentic. And that's what you want to come across with is the authenticity of yourself and let your passion come through, show what you love, have some energy, and then share that energy with other people. I know when I do interviews, that's one of the things that just happens is our energy rises during the interview. We pick up momentum. We have an awesome conversation. Next thing you know, 8, 20, or 45 minutes just flew by, and it felt like two minutes because it was just fun. And I'm genuinely, I can't stress this enough, be genuinely curious about the other person. When you really want to know and you really want to dig and find out why they're successful, what they did, that genuine curiosity will take you so far. It'll take you further than anything. And I really don't think genuine curiosity is something people can fake. So if you want to be an interviewer, start with genuine curiosity. So, and if you're on the other side and you're the interviewee, how mm -hmm. do I use the product that you create, right? You do an interview, you've planned it, you, you put them in that very comfortable position Mm -hmm. That 40 minutes went by, it felt like five. Yeah. Now what, right? Because we, we, we were talking before the show, with PR, it's not what you get in terms of coverage. It's what you do with yeah. it. So what do people do with your interviews uh, after that great experience? 
the best thing they do is share it with their own audiences. And it's something different. Their audiences, especially if it's a thought leader, a speaker, they've seen them speak. They've seen the one, the uh, videos of them by themselves and they follow them. They love them. They're passionate. They learn from them. But with the interviews, it's a different side of them. Cause I'm going to ask questions that maybe they don't answer on their own. Maybe things they hadn't thought of before and watching an interview. I love it when people say, when they see the interviews, whether it's my, my connections, their connections. It's like, I felt like I was at Starbucks sitting next to eavesdropping on your conversation. That part is absolutely awesome. And that's what people do is it's take it to your audience and share new content. You didn't have to write a script. You didn't have to think about it. You didn't have to stand alone for 40 minutes and talk into a camera. That's daunting. If they even want to do that at all in the first place, even eight unedited minutes, my YouTube videos, I don't, some people don't want to talk it for eight minutes, but they'll be interviewed. And then 20 minute podcast, 45 minute radio show, they get content and all they had to do was answer questions. That's the biggest thing for them is it, it builds their brand. It gives them marketing materials. It gives a new side of them to their audiences. If they're just getting going, it helps build their audience. Maybe you didn't see the person interviewed before. Maybe they, he or she told different stories they didn't tell before. That's the biggest thing they do is it's a, give quality content to their audience while expanding their audience at the same time. So people they might not have met if they didn't interview them and it didn't go maybe on my channel or someone else's channel. That that's fascinating. Um, we've arrived at the same place, right? And from two different perspectives, you are finding that you get all the thrill out of the, generation of the content getting people to tell stories and have that to share yep and i've spent the last eight years uh with the new content culture when i wrote my book uh was all about how do you get narrow cast distribution right it's not about eight i'm sorry not about four billion people on the internet it's about the 50 that you need to talk to this year to make your numbers yep. and and how do you get people to get out of that? I'm too busy to do uh, video and it's too expensive. No, well, no, actually, there's an ROI to it and there's a formula to it. We can teach it to you. Well, if I can add and, something, and to please put it right in the middle of what you're saying. With that, you just brought up an awesome ish, uh, awesome opportunity. Thank you. Today, with freelance sites, the, one of the biggest things that people will say is, well, I'm not comfortable with technology. Pre-2020, a lot of people did live interviews because that's what you were supposed to do. And that I'm not, that's expensive. Some day-long photo shoots quote out at 10 and 15 freaking grand. It's nuts. The silver lining of 2020 and everything since, and everyone's used to Zoom. Zoom is free. If you want to record for 45 minutes, it's like 15 bucks a month. So it's next to free, even to record. And people are used to it now. We live in a virtual space that Zoom is okay. Your phone is okay. People don't need a polished full day photo shoot with cinematic quality cameras. And, oh, I don't know what to do with it. I don't like editing. Oh my gosh, go to a freelance site for 10 to 50. And I don't even know if you'd have to spend that much, but let's just say it, 10 to $50. You can have someone make it look pretty to put on your YouTube station. All you have to do is ask questions. And like I said, once you start asking questions, it's just practice, do it again, 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 record, record, record. You're going to build your interviewing muscle. You'll get it out there. And because everyone's used to Zoom, everyone's used to the, the, like what we're on right now, there's never been a better opportunity to put yourself out there as an interviewer than there is now. And, and, and I'll do a little uh, plug for then the podcast ecosystem, because when you need to start doing that at scale, right, you've outgrown your virtual assistant and your $50 solution. Uh, and, you, you know, there's a lot at stake. But most of the big projects I've done, uh, Kodak, Vodafone, uh, IBM, um, to a smaller degree, Apple, and my role there, um, the payback is huge. There's an ROI on this. When you start thinking about it, well, if I put this effort in and I spend a little money here and I have a plan and a distribution plan, now I can connect the dots and see the ROI. And I, on multiple occasions, I've been in meetings where the CEO says, oh, wait a minute, I just have to spend 15 grand. I'm trying to sell a $400,000 product. Yep. You know, at, at the at a three-year contract, 
at $125,000 a year. And all of a sudden you're saying for a small amount of effort, creating this media takes an hour or two of an executive's time, right? And you spawn a month of, a month of content and the social media team has material to work with. And uh, you've got stuff to give your agency and you can, I've been in situations where we give the material to multiple agencies and each of them does their role, right? So it works at scale and it works at, at the, um, the uh, Upwork yep. level, right? And it's really finding a way to capture content and then chop it up and do things like make SEO content, make social media content, do it in a, in a formulaic way. And then it's, it's very affordable and the payoff can be huge. I'll get off. One thing I love with content and interviewing people is when people say, I want to become an expert. I want to build my brand. What they talk about is I don't have enough to say. What if I'm just getting started? I'm in my twenties or you know what age, forget about age. I'm at any age and I'm not a thought leader yet, or I'm not an expert. I don't know if I have a book in me. I don't know if I have a 10 minute, a 15 minute Ted talk in me. Pick a niche like I did with mentoring, like I did with events, like I did with podcasting. Go interview people. Have a question or series of questions if you need them. Use how and why. Go find experts in the field and interview them. Pump out some content. Put the videos on YouTube. I was doing, like I said, my first 80 episodes of my podcast were audio only, but I got 80 episodes done. I didn't have to write content for 80 episodes, hundreds of hours, and YouTube station, everything else. They write it for you. All you have to do is ask them questions. The key here is your guests are the feature, the focus. You're talking 20% of the time. They're talking 80% of the time. Once you get past episode 10, 11, 12, 13, 40, 50, 80, then the common thread is you and your topic, podcasting, mentoring, events, whatever it might be. People are going to remember you. You become the brand. You become the expert. You don't have to write the content. I almost forgot to mention that but that's a huge part of becoming an expert. It's like, wow. And people appreciate that. It's not just buy my stuff, buy my stuff. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Showcase other people's genius. It's going to take you a lot further than if you just do your own. What's people's favorite subject? Themselves. You know, they spend, yeah. And they spend hours a day on developing their expertise and, and trying to get people to understand and, and so I hear the value, a lot of the value in what you do comes through getting people to tell their stories and putting them in a good place to do it. Absolutely. All right. Now for the bonus round, who's your favorite band? Um, there's two answers. One, growing up, Aerosmith. Right. Without a doubt, I've seen them in concert more than I can count. Got to see them like literally 20 feet away when they did the residency in Vegas. It was nuts being that close to them after seeing them in arenas. And that was growing up. I would say their album Get a Grip was my social and dating life in the 90s. Perfect from happy to sad. I remember blasting Aerosmith crying on my tape deck at the time, again, dating myself after I got broke up with one of my first real girlfriends. And just, Meh. But Aerosmith definitely... Currently, I disagree with politics. I'm throwing it out there, though. Forget politics. Kid Rock, and it's not just because it's Detroit connection. He's the CEO of his own company. I love his music. I, it's, it gets you pumped up. It's like, I'm going to do this. I can do anything. I love that. It's coupled with the mm. fact that he's the CEO of Top Dog Records, and he has been since a younger age. And at least my understanding, when record companies um, sign you, they own your music. They distribute it. They put it in commercials. They say whether you can or can't use it. He licenses his music. And I, I won't go on because I don't. he doesn't have the autobiography that's like out Prince. yet. But I, that's the gist. That's like Prince. Yeah, that's I the gist of what I know about it. He did it since he was a kid. That's what, killed, that's what gets me. It's like, wow, before he was famous, he's like, oh, hell no. I'm going to control this. Fascinating. Well, I mean, you look at the business side and what, what I love about rock and roll is there's so many things to draw from this, right? So we do interviewing, we produce media, make sure you own your media, right? And build partnerships with that media, but you have to be in control of your media 
Look at what happened to uh, Taylor Swift. Politics aside, right? She lost control of her media, but she owned the rights to the music and the lyrics. I think didn't so she, she re redo them? She because I think that's like the whatever album Taylor's version. So she had, like had to technically re-record them or something. Yep. Yep. So I've had the experience um, of my girlfriend's daughter is a Taylor Swift. Uh, uh, Swifty. A Swifty. I guess it, I'm, I'm, now I feel like I'm dating myself. But you, you just look at what the lesson is that she's learning about agency and, and you know, empowering yourself and taking uh, responsibility and accountability for your own your own stuff. And uh, the, the lessons that she's been learning from that and Kid Rock and Prince, uh, Bruce Springsteen, you know, when you are really good, you can call the shots. And, you know, one of the challenges in life is and, and why you go get mentors is to get really good. Exactly. Um, so you said you you've how many times have you seen Aerosmith? I could countless every time when I was from a teenager until Las Vegas was 2019. We had second row center wow. seats for their 20, whatever, 22, I think it was 2022 concert. And then it, something happened with vocals. And we're on a wait. We're waiting to see if they even rescheduled. It was like second row center. Yes. Ah, throat problems with Steven Tyler, but I've seen them easily 20 times easily. Yeah. Wow. My only Aerosmith story, I've never seen him live. Um, I kind of lost interest later uh, in, in the in the 1990s. Um, I just I just lost interest in them. But in I'll date myself. They played Chicago and they were on the loop. They, they had a live show on a radio station that's no longer around called The Loop. And I. Uh, I invited all my buddies to come over and we were going to have a recording session and we were going to record that. And we all brought our tape decks and I'll just say it got a little out of control. And my mom was not home. And I thought there was going to be like three or four guys. And it was like 14. <laughs> show up. Nice. And it got a little rowdy and I lost my, ability to get my driver's license. I, I was 16. I know I was because I lost a year. I was grounded for life <laughs> and no car. And I mean, it just got out of control. So oh. that's my error. Sorry. <laughs> hopefully it was worth it, man. You had to pay your dues, but hopefully I had fun for a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, um, you know, well, that's part of rock and roll is uh, it, it gets a little crazy sometimes. Um, but at the same time, it's business and it's artistic. And I love talking to people about, you know, the, the emotional connections and what, what they get out of it. Um, got any, got any, uh, like, oh my God, Aerosmith stories from one of those 20 shows? No, but I do have a kid. Rock All righty, let's go. I was, let's say, 16, 17. I, ju I had just got in my car. I had a, which was dangerous, a Trans Am with anyone who knows. I'm not a mechanic by any means. I just know I had a 350, which meant it was freaking fast. So I was living the stupid lifestyle of a teenager. And then he was playing with a band called Insane Clown Posse in a bowling, I'm not joking, a bowling alley <laughs> with a theater <laughs> attached to the bowling alley. Okay. And they were playing the stage. We had been, I'll just say, smoking and drinking so it was what it was i'll leave it it's at that rock and, roll. and the mosh pit started and i got cocky pushed the wrong guy who turned out to be a bouncer and got my ass physically thrown out halfway through the concert <laughs> into an alley outside of a bowling alley because i tried to pick a fight with a bouncer <laughs> oh my god never again in my old age i would probably ground my if i had kids i'd ground them for doing that but yeah that i remember that was now that he plays arenas it was, no it was a little rinky ding bowling alley in roseville, roseville michigan my freshman year i saw david allen co do you know yeah um, so it, this is a business podcast so we'll just leave it at there but i was a freshman and um had a few beers and i thought it'd be really cool to go up and say hi, hi to him 
and the bouncer i literally came within that close of getting hit with a flashlight <laughs> yep so bouncers will do that i can you. i can relate um but uh well i thank you for sharing your story we we have found rock and roll to be such a connector um you know a, a bit like sports is something you can talk about as a meeting's getting ready to get together but unlike sports it tends to have a broader audience um you know i think as we try and figure out how to be more inclusive we need to have different things to talk about so appreciate your uh, your coming on here uh, you got some great stories and uh, thank you for sharing I hope people can learn a lot from it. And why don't you tell people how they can get in touch with you? Definitely. You can go to, easy to remember, I'll give you two. They both get to about the same places. Uh, MarkJCarter.com has everything. The radio show, the podcast, the eight unedited minute section for the YouTube videos embedded. And if you want to check out the book and everything else, it'll take you there too. If it's easy to remember, ideaclimbing.com takes you right to the podcast. Right there is the check it out on Apple. Check it out on all the platforms. Subscribe. I'd love to see you there. Again, it's ideaclimbing.com. And that's the best place to find me. You can also connect to my YouTube through there too. Outstanding. Um Thank you for joining us. And uh, I look forward to producing some shows together and oh, getting yeah. the distribution. We're like yin and yang here. We're going to have some fun. Okay. All right, everybody. Take care. Thank you.